Hi, I'm Stan Peek, and I'm a results leader. You're listening to ResultsLeader.fm. Being a thought leader is easy. Getting results is hard. This show is for the results leader who lives and dies by their results. Here is your host and chief results leader, Jonathan Rivera. You are listening to ResultsLeader.fm. Welcome back to another edition. And today I've got something really different. I've got a guy who said his big advantage in life was breaking his back. Yeah, it sounds sick. It sounds twisted. And I wouldn't expect anything less from Mr. Stan Peak helping people unlock their potential. And you'll see why in today's interview. Stan, welcome to the show, my brother. Are you ready to go? Ready to rock, Jonathan. Thanks for having me, brother. All right. Let's do it. Let's do it indeed. Let's give our listeners a quick win. What book have you given most as a gift? Well, I've written several books, and so I end up giving my own books as a gift. But ironically, even having written a number one bestseller on sales, the book that's not mine that I've gifted the most is Level 5 Selling. A great, quick, short read. It's the book that I philosophically align with the most over and above what I've put into paper. I want you to share a story of how an apparent failure set you up for later success. We, I've got a lot of those. We don't have enough time, but I'll tell you one. And I really have a philosophy of waste no success. And in order to waste no success, you can't waste any failures either. So Shortly after I started my coaching business, after leaving my second business, you know, I had a small nest egg, was working away, grinding away, and I broke my back in a mountain biking accident. Uh, Lots of fun. Uh, I had to wear a cervical thoracic orthotic, a CTO, and so it was like up to here. And I couldn't shoulder check because I couldn't turn my head, so I couldn't drive. Anyone out there building a service-based business, they know how important networking is. But the point of the failure is cash was dwindling. It was very hard to build my business when I couldn't drive and get places. It made me desperate, but the desperation led to creativity. In fact, I told my mentor, who's now a friend and business partner, that I wasn't going to waste a perfectly good broken back. And I was going to find a way to turn this into an unfair advantage. I didn't know how the heck I was going to do that. Long story short, I started documenting the process. And it turned into a book. It was an okay book. I made lots of mistakes. We all do when we learn. I'm sure the first bit of content you put out isn't nearly as good as what you're doing today. But that, that's what that turned into. And then I took that book and I pitched Entrepreneur Magazine and I got published in Entrepreneur, which then led me to get published in other places and on stages. So a broken back absolutely would not have been the kind of advantage I would have chosen. And not a strategy I picked, but a failure that I didn't waste that actually led to opening doors for me that I could not have opened for myself otherwise. So uh, I think everybody wants to know, are you still mountain biking? I am. Another really quick story. My son plays hockey and his first year playing hockey, he's like five. We're in Canada. I mean, we are pretty much born with skates on, right? So he fell on the ice and hit his head when he's about five and he was crying and he wanted to go home and dad, I want to quit. Like, absolutely, buddy. We can go home, but you can't quit. We can go home as soon as you do three more laps around the rink. I'm like, take as long as you want. I got nothing. We'll cry, whatever. Takes about 10 minutes and gets himself together, does his three laps, sure enough, doesn't want to go home. And so, and now he's, gosh, eight years later, he's still playing hockey. The point of that, though, is that I can't say that to my son and not drink my own Kool-Aid. So I made a point of getting back on my mountain bike in less than a year after I broke my mountain bike. I mountain bike like a middle-aged man now, but I do uh, mountain bike regularly. It's, It's one of my favorite forms of exercise. Let's talk about investments. What would you say is the most worthwhile investment that you've ever made? I'm sure I'm going to say the same thing a lot of people that have been on your show say, and that's the investment in themselves. Yes, I've invested in businesses and that turned out well. I bought into my second business and, you know, when all is said and done, probably tripled my money over a few years. But when I look at even this business, you know, becoming an executive coach, I went back to school twice. I got my executive coaching certification, 
certified corporate facilitator, certified in cultural transformation tools. I can't even begin to tell you how many books I've read. Let's say that I've spent somewhere between fifty and $100,000 on educating myself and improving my skills. If you just look at a straight investment, then I've probably 10x'd that money in seven years. Show me, like S&P 500, you're not getting those returns. Any portfolio manager would love to say that they can 10x your money in seven years or less. Financially, that is absolutely, demonstrably, the best investment I've ever made. Man, and uh, financial advisors might uh, recommend you don't do all that kind of investing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm a, I'm are you crazy? There are some great ones. I do have a financial <laughs> advisor. Please don't fire your financial advisor. Oh, that's too good, man. So let's think back over the last five years. What new belief, behavior, or habit has most improved your life? I'd love to say there was like one thing I discovered in the last five years that was a lightning rod moment and everything changed, but it's a lot less sexy and a bit more boring than that. And, and it really comes down to the power of incremental returns. You know, I've been exercising for 33 years. That daily discipline just has proved wonders. I, I tell a lot of clients, if they don't have like a fitness or health background, that exercise is still important in the boardroom because it helps you build the resiliency muscle. So doubling down on some of those. However, you know, to be more practical, there is one exercise I took a client through and the results were profound enough that I started scratching my head saying, I got to do this. And the quick story was this client hired me because they were working 98 hours a week. Oh. Yep. And they weren't making enough. Well, so at least one thing's wrong here, right? We did a time audit. I had this entrepreneur reflect on what they did every day, every week and organize their time into kind of the major buck. I'm not gonna micromanage anybody, but I wanted to understand the root of the issue. This entrepreneur kind of came back to me at our next session a week later, and they had about 12 buckets of how they spent their time for the most part. And when we went through their time audit, by the way, their assumption was that they their time was worth about $85 an hour as a blanket figure, which would have not led to the working all the time, but broke, but that's beside the point. 11 of their 12 buckets, were important, but didn't generate any economic value. Business processes, follow-up, you know, important stuff, but that didn't have a, a provable ROI. Their 12th bucket, however, was worth $250 an hour. <laughs> wow. And we looked at that and we made a couple changes and we were able to ratchet that up to being worth 400 an hour. Then we took those other 11 buckets and we decided that if we could take 38 that's what we got up to of what they could delegate. 38 hours a week, we could hire somebody. And even if we paid them 25 bucks an hour, which not all those tasks we would have had to, but even at that assumption, if they would have taken five hours of those 38 that came off their plate and repurposed them into that 250 to $400 bucket, the end result was this entrepreneur worked 33 hours a week less and made $2,500 more. So just like night and day results. So I decided to audit my time and I found that my time was either worth negative money. Think about it. If I'm meeting with someone who we never do business together, I pay for parking, I drive, I buy lunch. It doesn't go anywhere. It might be a great, beautiful friendship. That is not, it's still worthwhile. But on the business front, my time can be worth negative money. Then I think about where my time has been the most beneficial and what it's taken me to acquire business my time is potentially worth at the highest level up to $2.5 million an hour. That's the time audit I did. Real results. And so if my time could be worth $2.5 million per hour, how dare I spend it on BS activities? So that was one of the most powerful exercises I did in the last five years. And it, it's great to kind of uh, hold me accountable to waste time. Not to say I don't try stuff that doesn't work. I make mistakes every day in my business because I'm trying new things. But I don't waste time. I try not to. I want to go back, just touch on this because it's actually one of the things that I think people like most when we're discussing uh, success and daily disciplines. What are some of your daily disciplines that contribute to your success? Great question. And uh, they're, you know, wake up before six. Before COVID, I would, my alarm would go off at 514 every day. And then I would get up and I know it's an odd time, but I had kind of figured out 
how much time do I need to work out, shower, get ready, eat, go? So that's why that exact time. Extra minute of sleep, sign me up. But I still make sure I wake up before six, get my workout in. My workout is the most important way that I start my day. And I always say, even if it's a 10 minute workout, which I've done, the workout you do is 100% better than that beautiful hour workout at the gym that you miss. So even if it's running, I run around my basement some mornings. I probably look like a lunatic, but at least I get it done. I get moving. You know, I get the synapses primed. It's such an important part of my day. And then I go into the other parts of my discipline, which is uh, I get to gratitude. I think about what I have to be grateful for. You cannot wait to be happy until you have that thing or that thing or that thing because you'll never get there. There'll always be something else you don't have. And our focus dictates our reality. So we focus on what we have to be grateful for, or we focus on someone else that has it better than us. Choice is ours, right? So the gratitude one comes next. Then it comes down to uh, reflecting on the state of all the important relationships in my life. I have no interest in building a you know seven, eight, nine-figure business only to go, where the hell's my family? I think about my role as a father, my role as a husband, my role as a friend. And I, I ask myself, David Goggins, by the way, has an accountability mirror. I don't do it in front of the mirror. I do it while I'm exercising. And I ponder, how am I showing up in each of these key roles? Because that's what matters at the end of the day. Then I think about my day and I, okay, what do I have to do? And what does success look like? I visualize kicking ass in every aspect of the day. I thought about us being together earlier this morning. I thought, what might we talk about? How can I give the most value I possibly can to your audience? And I frame that and I visualize it and will it to be so. Finally, you know, maybe I scribble a couple of things to tweak my day. Then I get after it. And then I make sure I document what got done, what didn't, what do I have to move? So I don't drop things. I don't forget things. Uh, lots of times I don't get done what I hope to accomplish but I don't forget about it. I make sure I come back after it. So there's, there's lots more. Even one actually small one that's worth mentioning because the devil's in the details is even the small things at home, like everything has a place. My wife's going to kill me if she listens to this, but she can never find her keys. And I joke about it. I actually bought something that says keys. It's a little hook. I hung it by the garage. And every time she can't find her keys, I'm like, maybe I should hang something for you to put your keys on. Because, and I, yeah, she doesn't, she doesn't find it funny She appreciates that, doesn't she? (laughs) She absolutely hates that. But for me, my keys are in the same place every single day. If I go out once in the day, five times in the day, my keys are in the same place every time. So I never lose time or get frustrated and get my day off on the wrong foot going, where's my keys? And there's a bunch of those little disciplines. My workout clothes are in the same place the night before. So I don't have to make a ruckus or think about it in the morning. It just, it's, there's a million things we can do to set ourselves up for success with the little disciplines so that we don't have the big moments of making decisions on, do I work out or do I not? Do I try to grow my business today or do I not? And when it, when you have those disciplines built up, motivation is uh, less required. I'm not going to say it's not required. It's less required. It's way easier to be in a state of flow as well. Mm. I could go on. Dude, you're speaking my language right there with all I'm of sure. that. Yeah, I do all of those things. I got the clothes out, all of it. No, I'm working out without thinking. That way it reduces the resistance. So I love that you brought that. What What would you say are some bad recommendations you hear in your area of expertise? Yeah, great question. Um, I think one is, uh, so there's a lot of thought leaders out there, influencers, I hate all those words, because again, it's, it's kind of like someone getting up there and me saying, you know what, Jonathan, I'm super humble. Well, the very act of you saying that means you're not. So the, the reason I bring that up is because, you know, my, my background before becoming an executive coach was that I was a fitness coach for 18 years. What was interesting is I wasn't the biggest guy. I mean, yeah, I played linebacker in university. I'm not a small guy. But a lot of times people will go to the gym and they'll go up to the most jacked dude or the prettiest girl or fittest looking girl. And, and then they're like, well, that's who I want to get advice from. And, and the, the reason I bring that up is because that is not necessarily the way to vet professionals. They might know what works for them. Heck, for all we know, they might be on steroids, right? Or they just might have won the genetic lottery. Sometimes the person who's the best coach for you may or may not look the park. Often they do. But that's the person who's going to take the time to get to know you, your reality, your goals, 
you know, your, your mental constitution and find out what's possible and practical for you. All that preamble to say in my, in coaching, one of the worst things I see is a prescriptive approach. Jonathan, this is what I did, so this is what you should do. I don't know how to do what you do. If I was ever going to help you as a coach, I have to take the time. I have to be curious to learn about your business, your goals, you, your values, your purpose, what drives you. And only when I have that information and that bond can I maybe be of use to help guide you and support you along the way. I personally am not smart enough to say, here's a roadmap for success, follow it, and I guarantee you'll be successful. And I say that having written a book called Success is a System. I think that's dangerous to go, there's one way to be successful. Here it is. I've cornered the market on it. So I've been told in the past when seeking out mentorship, hey, look for the people doing what you want to be doing. And now I feel like you went the opposite way on them if that person maybe looks like they're doing what you want to be doing, but but maybe they can't lead you there. So what do you say to those people that are looking out there for the, the hottest trainer or the most jacked trainer? What do you say to those people? Well, a couple of things. Uh, they, I'm sure they have something to teach you. I, I do believe in success leaves clues. I think it's always important to ask how they got there. What did they do? I, one of the questions I love to ask, I've had the good fortune of interviewing some phenomenally successful people. And I always love to ask who their mentor was. When I see someone who has achieved otherworldly success, I, where did they get that dr internal drive from? Where did they get their playbook from? Who did they learn from? I love that question. I do like to do that. And again, someone who's been there before, someone who's grown a million dollar or billion dollar business has advice to give someone who aspires to get there. They just might not have a, you know, plug and play recipe. That's my point. So it's important to glean what wisdom you can from as many people as you can, and then integrate that again with your own values, your own purpose and vision, because then you can really uh, have your own success, even though you've taken elements from other people's recipes. All right, I know you were getting into that and we were just about to get into my favorite part where we talk about results. But first, I wanna ask you a question. Are you picking up what we're laying down on this show? Are you digging what we are sharing? If you are, why not make yourself a hero today and share this with somebody who can use it? Put this out on your social media channels, hashtag results. Leader FM. I'll be out there looking for you and I'll make sure to boost it up too when I see you. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's jump back into the interview. So let's talk about results. Why do results matter? At the end of the day, that's what we all are gunning for. We talk about it's not the journey, it's the destination. That's what people say when they're trying to get people to enjoy life while we're mentally living somewhere else, hoping that that comes to fruition. Nobody, and I mean nobody, is exactly where they want to be. That doesn't mean people aren't enjoying and fully immersed in the moment. I believe it's important to be happy but never satisfied. And what I mean by that is be present, be appreciative. Don't be on your phone when your kid's trying to talk to you. Don't be daydreaming about you know having drinks with your friends when there's work to be done. Be present and enjoy it but don't be satisfied that i'm there because there's always another level like for me personal development is my number one core value i'm always trying to learn how to be a better entrepreneur a better coach better husband better father learn new techniques in the gym whatever the case may be i think it's so important to have a, a line on the destination but but understand that like happiness and success are not the same thing if we wait to be successful, sorry, if we wait to be happy until we're successful, whatever that looks like for us, recipe for misery. And if we focus on just the things that make us happy and we avoid the little disciplines that we need to, to become more successful, then we kind of miss out on both. And I know I'm kind of going all over the map a little bit here, but I just think we get one shot at life. That's my belief. And so it's important to constantly be bettering, bettering yourself to be able to provide from your family, have amazing experiences, be better at what you do, be of greater service, but also enjoy the present because tomorrow's not guaranteed. 
In the last five years, what new realization has helped you get better results for your clients? I mentioned the time thing. That was critical. Also, the fact that the world has changed. That's what it's come down to. If you look at the Great Resignation, which they're now calling the Great Reset, in 2019, especially early in 2019, the average person that came to me for help was trying to grow their business, grow their leadership, become more successful. What the advantage that, that I've really chose to take out of you know, the last few years is that people are starting to question their motives at a deeper level. I was trying to get them there before anyway, but now you've got this blatantly obvious thing right in front of all of our faces to say, hey, are you really focused on what matters? Because what you're gunning for could be taken away at any given time. So in a way, it's actually helped me as a coach, not to land more business per se, but to people are more open to considering what's profound and what's real versus more societal dictated success. What area of your business would you like better results? I guess where I'd like better results is probably leaning right into my gaps. My administrative game isn't as tight as it could be. That's my favorite employee is usually our EA, the person who really I always try to hire opposite of my strengths. That is an area of my game and therefore my business that is weaker. That being said, the advantage of having great business partners is that their strengths often shore up my gaps. So, but, but that's really what I would say. I mean, I also, I do a lot of 360 reviews for, the, for your audience. If they don't know what that is, a stakeholder survey where you send it out to your coworkers, direct reports, direct supervisor, significant other, all about your strengths and opportunities for improvement. I've always tried to get people to understand, work on your shortcomings. You can get better, but you're going to get greater ROI, greater return by focusing on your strengths. If I work on my IT skills, then I'm going to take years to bring it up to a level of marginality. But if I focus on my coaching skills over time, then, you know, I take a strength and turn it into a potential area of world-class brilliance. And I'll never do that as an IT professional. I'll sure as hell never do that as a graphic designer. And I could sing the rest of my life and I will still sound like Frank Frankenstein at karaoke night. What results are you most proud of? So the results, well, I mean, the one that I'm the most proud of is I, I had a, someone I worked with years ago who was at a really dark place. They actually mentioned that they were they were thinking about it. And I'll never forget that. Like that, there's, we all want to grow our businesses. We all want to do cool things. We all want to see the world and, and, you know, have people that we love with us along the way. But when someone was at that bleak place, and candidly, I've lost friends to suicide. I'm most proud that that person, A, didn't go through with it, and B, was able to find joy, find happiness, find purpose. And I'm happy to report years later, they're crushing it. I'm not saying happily ever after. I'm sure they have their tough days, because we all do. But that that's one of those, like, that made a difference, and someone's here today, and they, they, there was a possibility of that not being the case. In terms of business results, I'm always happy when someone comes to me with something that would be nice someday, but they, they put that on the other side of their threshold of belief. If blah, 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 one day I'd like to. And to get people there, someone who, you know, one day I'd like this promotion. Well, next thing you know, they're one step down from CEO and they're just in a huge organization and they're just pinch me. They love their job. They're drinking from a fire hose. It's the pace is insane, but they love it. And they were put on this planet to professionally do what they're doing. And they didn't think they were capable of probably two jobs below that. So I, I love getting people to where they really belong, the, the level that they should be playing at. Same as like a husband and wife team that couldn't pay their bills. They were stressed out all the time. They work together. They're married. They're fighting more. They're wondering if it's all worth it. One year, we took them from uh, 200000 in top line revenue. It's years in, not like first year. It was three or four years in. They went from 200000 to 500000 in one year. Any married people out there, we know money is one of the most common fights you have. So when you can take your top line revenue and almost triple it in one year, they put down like they paid $50,000 off in debt in one year. And then they fired their landlord. They bought their own building. And now they're, I'm not saying again, happily ever after, but they have different problems. They have better problems. So I love stories like that. All right. Any parting thoughts you want to share with the results leaders who are listening to us right now? 
Yeah, Stephen Covey, you know, one of my clients is a big Covey fan, and he his favorite Stephen Covey-ism, one of the seven habits, is to always start with the end in mind. And what I find, is, especially for a lot of coaches or consultants, knowledge experts, whatever you want to say, we're in such a rush to provide value sometimes that it's possible that we actually start sprinting whether or not we realize if we're heading in the right direction. So it's so important if we think about it, if we're going to be of value and we're going to generate results, to slow down to speed up, to take some time and really figure it out, what are the real results that my client or me personally am, am trying to achieve and why? Answer that question. I mean, come on, start with why. Simon Sinek, he's done a great job of bringing that more to the forefront, but I still don't think we ask that question enough. And then when we figure it out, when you really can add conviction to your strategy, then the results, they're not spoken for yet, but it's a lot easier to get there. So though that would be my parting advice. And just last thing is those of you fighting the good fight, don't quit. You might not knock it out of the park every day. Sometimes as an entrepreneur, as a leader, as a human being, sometimes success is just not quitting. You've heard some of my stories. I could share a million more. If you don't quit today and you dust yourself off and try again tomorrow, you're still in the fight. You've got a chance. You might be crushing it next week, next year. Ain't that the truth? And I know that our listeners are going to want more from you. Where can they go get it? Two places, brother. I'm available over email, Stan, S-T-A-N, at getsuccessfaster.com, all one word, or I'm very active on LinkedIn. I'm not great on every social media platform, so I spend most of my time on LinkedIn. That's where my audience is, and that's where I love to engage with everybody. Stan, we will be sure to have links in the show notes. I appreciate you bringing it today. Thank you so much, and thank you, results leaders, for tuning in. We'll be back in your earbuds next time. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. That is a wrap for another edition of ResultsLeader.fm. If you are out there getting results for your clients and you want to be featured on the show, go to ResultsLeader.fm now and apply to be on the show. And if you love what you're hearing, share the show, give us a rating and review, do anything to help us get the message out there. Thought leadership is easy, but results leadership is hard. We'll catch you on the next one. This program is brought to you by thepodcastfactory.com.